Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 79 for Monday, March 9th, 2020. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as Pixorifs, and joining me, as always, is Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. Good day, good day, good day. Uh, we have just been talking about Dungeons & Dragons, sub-block details, and what else are we talked about in the render distance? A bunch of other nerdy things that, that we were both uh, up to over the weekend. If you'd like to get the extended version of the podcast, you could do so at the Spawn Chunks on patreon.com super easy to find and you get extra content it's awesome so what have you been up to in minecraft this week i've seen you uh streaming at different times these days yeah so over the weekend in canada the time change happened and uh messed up everyone and so <laughs> i had i had uh, i thought i had lost an hour of the day but instead i had lost an hour of sleep which meant i gained an hour in the day so it all balanced out uh and i ended up streaming a little bit extra this weekend uh, actually i had some plans cancel and uh saturday was funky weather and sunday was just like oh i have an entire afternoon to myself so let's do some more minecraft so i had a lot of fun doing some streams from the modern city and uh i actually streamed a few times during the week albeit shorter uh, I just found myself inspired to get into Minecraft and, and work on these things. I think because the the modern city is taking so long, I'm kind of itching to finish that first building and and get things in place. But uh, And we'll talk about this as one of our listener emails later. I am finding the to-do list is growing just exponentially mm -hmm. in, in the city, um, both technically and creatively. Like there's things I want to do, things that get mentioned in... in um, uh, uh twitch chat like oh are you guys gonna have a hospital and i'm like of course we're gonna have a hospital and i'm like reaching over and just, like writing down don't forget to build a hospital <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, just because i hadn't thought of that uh so there's all these plans uh but i'm also feeling it's like this combination of feeling creatively constipated because like you want to do these things but they require infrastructure and design decisions early because moving them later is a pain yeah you know like if you put in a train track like you don't want to have to move a 200 block train track you know three blocks to the left later on yeah and so i've been focusing on the stuff that is in place and that is it is um working and so i've been working on uh, water elevators uh we did i desperately need to design or not design i desperately need to build a tnt um concrete maker because Man, do I, you think you have a lot of concrete in your inventory. One shulker box of concrete doesn't do much when you're doing a, you know, 140 block tall apartment building. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I've been noticing the resource grind there. Um, it's, it's fun because it gives me some other cool stuff to do. Um, but I haven't attempted to do that on stream. I'm going to be building the one that Mumbo Jumbo designed uh, because I think that's probably all that I need. And it's not a terribly big build, but it's very complicated and not something that I've done before with like zero tick pistons and yeah. stuff. I took a lot of screenshots and I could probably do it. I would just have to maybe prep the Twitch audience for like, okay, so we're going to do redstone. It's going to be wrong. <laughs> uh, or I might get it wrong or not exact, or I might change it. So just, just hang tight. This is going to be slow. <laughs> yeah. You need, you need an on-screen disclaimer for like, don't like, let, let me learn, please. Like, let me, yeah. let me take this at my own pace instead of suggesting things. Cause I egg, find, egg. I find the problem with Twitch chat and Redstone, and this is not necessarily going to be a rant at anyone in particular, but I find Redstone so difficult to describe theoretically and so difficult to describe verbally. If I'm reading Twitch chat and somebody is telling me, you know, you need to put a piston there and run a pulse through this and zero tick that, like, I can't make head or tail of it. I need no. to have a visual idea of how things are put together and then i understand redstone a lot better but if somebody tries to describe to me in words or text how to do something with redstone i am all at sea it's just like a switch flips in my brain in my brain and they may as well be speaking a different language so mm. yeah I, I sympathize with anybody who's trying to do redstone on stream i've not made a habit of it lately yeah so uh, at least i'm not designing it um i've designed a little bit of redstone on stream before and it's sometimes it, it's fine when it works or it's something that you've done before and you can explain it but then other times when it doesn't work uh you, you're just like oh wait a minute like this i don't know i don't know what's wrong and i cannot problem solve this and keep up with chat at the same time so yeah. i end up just kind of coming back to it later usually when i have a a fresh uh a fresh head but i also find that's it's something i do with artwork as well if i get stuck on a design i walk away i do the dishes i take a shower i work out i come back three hours later and then the problem just like solves itself like you just kind of need to you know etch a sketch your brain kind of shake it out for a little bit sometimes yeah. um and one of the issues that i'm actually running into though with uh, the high-rise build is that i have a number of vine drops so i've got a question for you and i've got a question for our listening audience uh 
I want to know if there's a height limit to the vine drops that you can build in Minecraft. So a lot of people use water. Uh, a lot of people will use like a slime block at the bottom. Uh, I have been using vines because I prefer the soft landing. The idea is that depending on what feather falling you have on your boots, you put the vine two to three blocks above the ground. And then when you go down a one by one tube, uh, the vine, which is on all four sides of that tube, um, will catch you and slowly drop you. And then you just drop out and you only drop like two to three blocks, at which point you don't take any damage. So you don't have that little like knee crunch, you know, that Minecraft gives you when you jump off something too high. Mm -hmm. And you don't have the splash of landing in water and you're not uh, in in water that you have to then swim out of to then move on. You're, you're ready to go. You're on the ground, feet running. Yep. I've got several of these. Uh, there's one in my swamp mine which goes from 63 64 down to y level six so it's 60 blocks there's another one in the end that goes from the end island all the way down to y equals one so that's 60 or 70 blocks easily i'm not sure what the end island y level is do you know that uh pass it varies it varies okay. dramatically and i will get to that in my uh, uh, in okay. my discussion of my skyblock let's play <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, so anyway, so so that so that there's that. So they I, they both work on the server fine. The other day when I was going through a vine drop that has been working repeatedly for me on the the Citadel for the last few weeks, it stopped working. I just started to drop straight through all the time. I was like, well, this is weird. Why mm. why am I dropping? It's only thirteen blocks. Like it's not even that far. Whereas the one directly next to it was working just fine. And then uh, I was making these uh, vine drops work on the high rise on the in the city build, and now now we're talking, I don't even know, eighty to one hundred blocks, easy, probably even one hundred twenty, coming down from from this uh, from this high rise. Now one of them isn't that tall; it's it's more like forty blocks, and it's a one by one. The one from the penthouse is a two by two because the building is centered uh, on an even number. And so I don't know whether having a two by two area with vines still all around the bottom is causing the issue, but I can, it worked once and I cannot get it to repeat. Uh, so I've had to waterlog two slabs at the bottom. So unfortunately you, I mean, you survive, but you still get this splash, which is not really the effect that I wanted. Yeah. Um, not the end of the world because we've, you're, we're using water elevators. We're pretending that water and water elevator tech is just part of this minecraft universe in this modern city so we're not pretending to make like real life elevators because that just seems like crazy problems for me yeah so we're just using the water stuff which is fun because then you can kind of make it look a little bit more modern and futuristic mm -hmm. um but like the water elevator when you go up to the penthouse like you actually get kind of bored that's how long the bubble <laughs> column is it's, yeah. it's like you go up and you're like uh um hmm uh um we there yet yeah oh here we are you know like it's it's that long and so the drop it's considerable and i don't know what it is about about the vine issues that that might have a limit to it but at least in 113 now that we can waterlog slabs with that change uh you don't have to have a full block of water you can just have a waterlog slab which is much easier to walk out of um than a like you're not bobbing yeah. you know so at least there's that, but it's still not quite what I, I wanted. So do you have any experience with like vine drops? I don't typically use them. Uh, the only time I've used them in the past was uh, on another server that somebody else, I think, put it there. And I've never really encountered a drop that you couldn't stop yourself on vines. I think normally people put vines like two or three blocks high and vines will often grow outside of that anyway because they vines. Um, mm. I think if I you... use string to cap them. That's yeah, how I yeah, that's, that's... them. Yeah. Uh, understandable i think um if you have a two by two area i think there's just going to be a, a section in the center where the hitbox of the vines will not interact with the hitbox of the player or rather the player is just going to fall down through them but if you stick to one wall as you're falling i don't know why that would be a problem so yeah yeah so I'm not sure. I, I should clarify uh, when i say two by two it's a two by one right that, okay yeah yeah it's too wide but it's still only one deep so you really when there's vines on s one two three six sides yeah, uh, you should still be caught. And maybe the other thing that I have, there's a couple things I haven't tried. I haven't tried a one by one from the same height. Yeah. And I haven't tried to increase the amount of vines on the higher drop. Yeah. Um, the reason why I don't use more than one vine most of the time is because the drops are shallow. And if you have more than one vine, it adds like this like extra beat 
at the bottom for you to like you have to wait to it, go yeah, through the vine it slows you down a little bit and it makes the whole yeah. experience less smooth yeah it's kind of like falling through a cobweb not quite that disruptive but it's yeah. it's close you know like it just it doesn't feel as smooth so i mean i could try i could try that there's a bunch of different things i have to try but yeah it's it's been it's been a little bit um a little bit frustrating i wish there was a slightly different way to do that like i kind of wish that what i was really hoping for with the new honey block was that they would work the same way that vines do because they look way nicer right yeah the vines you kind of have to hide when you're doing like modern builds or glass builds and stuff or if you've got if it's all glass then you just you see the vines um but with honey block you have to already be in the block yes so having a honey block even on all four sides doesn't do anything yeah you just if, fall straight through, you fall straight through the middle if you have vines they are technically speaking they are in the next block over if you see what i mean yes. like they are they are yes. occupying the block that you are landing in whereas a honey block is the opposite it is recessed opposite. into the wall by like yeah. a, a micro you know fraction of a block even if yeah. the block itself looks like a full block you have to push yourself into it in order to slide down so there are there are definitely yeah. mechanical differences there yeah and they're too slow to be a down elevator like if mm -hmm. i even if i did if i did the whole elevator that way it just it would you'd be waiting for forever yeah slower <laughs> than to... slower than even the much maligned magma block bubble column uh which Whoa, is yeah my my least favorite elevator because you still just take a bit of you know burning damage to the feet on the way out yeah. but uh, yeah it's also super slow i was so disappointed too because i put this bu bubble column in and i made the interior wall of it on glass on purpose because i thought well this is really cool the glass drop on the outside, you can see the outside of the building and the city as you're falling to your, not death, your hopefully survival and, and entrance into the lobby. But um, when you go up the bubble column, of course, because of the changes they made to, to water vision, you can't see anything. It's a big mm -hmm. blue blur. And he's like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was so disappointed that you can't see anything. I may even change. I might want all that glass back because <laughs> I'm just like, well, you can't see anything anyway. So I might as well just you know, change it into something like lights or something cool to go by because otherwise it's just it's just a giant waste of glass. Yeah. So what have you been up to, man? I am now working on the largest mountain in my mountain range, which is Huzzah. it's taking a lot. I, I I designed one sort of pizza slice of it and not one not one of those wide New York pizza slices. I'm talking like tiny Italian pizza slice. <laughs> uh it it is it is a, a sort of vertical ish section. I mean, you know, as vertical as this mountain gets. Uh, yeah. It took me four hours, <laughs> and so oh. uh, I, I've been doing this on streams, and streams are usually between three and four hours, and oh boy, yeah, this one is going to be probably most of my streams for the next couple of weeks just to get it done, and that's just the outside and not the detail, but I... I'm I'm happier and happier with the mountain range every time and once again people are asking me like how do you have the stamina for this and I'm mostly just looking at them and thinking this is just going to look incredible when it's done and the more I do on it the more I'm happy with it and even just placing it one block at a time it's really coming together so hopefully I'm going to be able to do some more with that soon um but of course that's that's the survival guide that all all of the work right now is going into that and I'm just finding other little things to keep me occupied on the side which actually ties into the email we have this week but more on that later um today or the video that went out today at least i fought the ender dragon in skyblock it did not go as well as previous ender dragon fights have done for me uh, I, died, I died twice and i lost all my gear once now let me tell you the circumstances in which i lost my gear because it's actually a bit of a screw up on my part at some point during the fight, I placed a water source because I was leaping down from a tower and I was trying to land in a bucket of water. And I can't remember if I made it or not, um, but either way, I didn't take enough full damage to die at that point. And I thought I had scooped this bucket of water back up, but Minecraft did that thing where it occasionally double clicks super fast for you. And so instead of picking up the water source, it made the slosh noise and it immediately placed the water again but in my kind of adrenaline-infused state where I was fighting the dragon, I thought, okay, I've got that bucket of water now. So fast forward a little bit. I've done a bit of damage to the dragon. It punts me up into the air like a hundred blocks. That one of those falls <laughs> that you're like, even with Feather Falling 4, I am not going to be surviving this one. So I fumble through my hotbar, realize that I have an empty water bucket on my hotbar, frantically open my inventory, switch out to the other one successfully, try and stick the landing with a water bucket, and fail so i've died i see all my stuff spread out around me but i think i have pressed right click and placed a, a water source right so i come back to the end look around for my stuff 
I see the place where I placed the water source earlier and it was close enough to the edge of the island that it was sort of where I thought I had been flung to and where I thought I had died. So my immediate assumption was that the game, like the internal server of the game, thought I had placed a bucket of water there even if it didn't look like it had on my screen and I died and then all of my stuff had been washed off the island into the void. Uh. So I continued punching the dragon. <laughs> I hadn't brought any more gear with me because I thought, okay, I'm just going to get all of my other gear back. I punched the dragon, which actually worked quite well for a while. Like, I took a significant chunk of this thing's health off of it just by, like, jumping up and down and hitting it in the leg. And all the while, my items were probably somewhere else on the island, and because it was taking me longer to kill the dragon at that point, they probably despawned when I came back. But they were still there somewhere, and so many people are now pointing that out to me in the comments, and I realized it when I was going back through editing that in the adrenaline rush of trying to get the dragon defeated, and I, I just made the immediate assumption when I saw that water source that, like, all my stuff must be gone, because I thought I'd picked up the other ones. So the right. only way a water source could have been there in the first place was from me placing it as I died. Um, so, so that was a bit of a mistake on my part, and I did end up losing all my gear. However, with it being Skyblock, you've got to remember that the only reason I have that gear in the first place is because I was able to, you know, acquire it through the general, you know, the gameplay loop of playing Skyblock, where you grind for resources and eventually end up trading with villagers. So, once I came back with some slightly worse gear that I had stockpiled and ended up beating the dragon, I was able to kind of you know treat that with in, in hindsight it wasn't such a bad thing we can always you know recover all of that stuff and i was able to successfully beat the dragon which means i can now spend some of my skyblock time going out to the outer end islands finding end cities i just have mm -hmm. to get enough material so that i can bridge out there and do that at this point nice the thing that i i haven't returned to skyblock in a while the minecraft city just kind of grabbed me by the mm -hmm. creative you know uh scruff of the neck and said yeah you should do this now um but I'm was I'm very curious to eventually have enough rockets and elytra in Skyblock to just fly around and see where the border is. Mm -hmm. You know, to be able to fly around and find the witch hut or find the other things that I I know are on the map, but would just be too time intensive to like grid search by pillaring out yes. <laughs> over over the void. Um, I I do find flying with elytra in the end and the idea of flying with elytra over a skyblock void to be still very intimidating. Uh, <laughs> yes. Only because I can't figure if like I can't always just visually discern if I'm pointing up or down. You know, yeah. like you just if you're over a big black area or a big big blue area, it is kind of difficult to figure out whether you're flying up or down. If you're flying um, between the central end island and the outer ring, especially, that gets yeah. disorienting very quickly. I found very a good quickly. a good way of getting around that if you're playing Java Edition at least is pressing F3 and G to turn on those chunk border lines that you can see, because at least oh. then you can tell whether you're going up or down based on the position of those nice. in the space. Perspective, yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense actually. That's a good idea. Yeah, uh, it would feel like Tron too. Would exactly. Be kind of fun. Yes, it's the yeah. cyber the cyberpunk grid kind of ah, thing. Yeah, nice. The infinite yeah, grid. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, th those are those are very helpful. I forget who it was. I think somebody left that as advice in one of my previous uh, survival guide episodes, and that was a, oh, a technique I had never really encountered before. So that was that was good work, whoever that was. <laughs> Cheers to you. Nice. Well, we have a fair bit of news to cover this week. What oh, say boy, do we? we? dive in uh, i'll uh, i'll grab this first one if you don't mind yeah because uh, I, I thought it was very interesting and uh and worth repeating the minecraft festival has been postponed uh and i'll quote and read from the post we'll have a link of course in the show notes if you guys want to read the whole thing uh in recent weeks the covid19 outbreak has led many organizers to cancel or postpone gatherings and events across the world as preventative measure to ensure the health and safety of their guests the situation around Minecraft Festival, however, is a little different. September is still many months away, and we have not, um, and we are not making any predictions about how long it will take to put the outbreak behind us. This decision is rather a result of the extensive preparations required to organize a mammoth event like this. Our partners, producers, and exhibitors are all based in corners of the world, and right now we can't meet and collaborate in the way that we need to. Uh, we also have a, a, a side note here that the live stream event. Uh, of Minecraft will still go ahead as um, as scheduled, so as it has in previous years. So we're still going to have like a Minecon Live type thing. They yeah. might call it Minecraft Festival Live. I'm not sure what naming convention they're going to use, but we're going to get a live stream event instead of an in-person event. Um, and if I recall, when they announced Minecraft Festival, 
there was going to be a live stream as part of that anyway. Yeah, yeah, it was always scheduled to be part of the event, but from within the confines of a three-day, you know, yeah. it's convention, basically. And it's it's a shame to see this happen naturally, but it seems like a smart move. In a week that had also, you know, announcements that TwitchCon, South by Southwest, various other kind of large-scale yep. conventions, and even smaller-scale things had been, uh, you know, either rescheduled or cancelled based on concerns about you know public health and coronavirus outbreak you know control mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff it, it is perfectly sensible for them especially in the context that they've given it where they have to meet with a bunch of people behind the scenes to make sure that everything can go ahead smoothly it makes sense that something as big as this and something with i think as much um anticipation as uh, as this event would have considering that physical minecraft events you know in-person events have been a thing in the past and are now being brought back with some fanfare that they would want to stick the landing they'd want to do it right oh and yeah if if this is going to lead to a situation where something could potentially go wrong and tarnish the reputation of the event then obviously we don't want that no exactly not to mention that i mean like for whatever reason probably because i know it's a small development team but you get the impression that minecraft is not a small game but the community around it when you play it you tend to find your own niche yeah so while i know that minecraft is in the back of my head the most popular video game on the planet i find it hard to recognize that on a daily basis mm -hmm. like my little my little window of minecraft is much smaller uh and so you think about this a three-day in-person minecraft event in the u.s in florida like there is that's a lot of people depending yes. on the venue that is a lot of people uh and could like you said be uh one a uh they want it to run smoothly be a very successful event that could potentially down the road rival things like pack east pax east you know other gaming convention um you've also got the concern of just that number of people you know in terms of you know public health and safety but then also i just think it's an excellent um i don't want to say moral stance it's just a good it's a good feeling uh on the behalf of the organizers to look out for their staff members and not yes. require them to go and do all this in-person planning for an in-person event when they may not feel comfortable to do so yeah um i listened to a, a podcast called daily tech news show that's been keeping quite close tabs on how covid19 is affecting things like conventions meetings um the gamescom was another one uh, uh cell phone uh also uh, cell phone conventions and then also production lines so p tech parts for computers and and things like that that are being interrupted by by the the outbreak and what i i kind of pulled from it is that a lot of companies are just saying like hey we we're in a, an age where you can very easily or potentially work from home yeah. If you want to and you can, please do. It's not going to change anything. There's no layoffs. There's like there's nothing like that. We're just we're just going to limit, you know, your um person to person contact because we have, you know, this information from the World Health Authority or from our local government, you know, etc. And I I I just think it's really responsible and it's nice that we live in a time where Minecraft Festival can say, "We're post post postponing the in-person event, but don't worry, the live stream is still going to go. You're going to get all the same information. You can't shake hands with your buddies, but you know, it th that's the, just the safer way to go." Yes, and if you do end up shaking hands with anybody's, uh wash them afterwards. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, uh, from from what I gather, they do plan to hold a Minecraft Festival the following year. So in 2021, we should hopefully see an in-person Minecraft Festival event return. Uh, so fingers crossed that that goes ahead. Obviously, tickets were supposed to go on sale on Friday, basically the day after they eventually made the announcement saying it was postponed. So everything was very much like leading up to it, and it must have been very tough for them to pull the plug. Obviously, yep. it's going to be tough for people who are really looking forward to the event as well, but at least not all hope is lost, and we should uh, be back with news of a similar event this time next year. Here's hoping. Fingers crossed. Yeah. And planning these kind of things is a huge endeavor and having another year to plan it, it's probably just going to be that much better. Absolutely. Yes, it's it's another year for us to uh, figure out what on earth we want to do regarding our attendance and <laughs> yeah, that's, potentially that's, that's, uh, that's... yeah, throw together some plans for maybe a, a podcast or two. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. 
Uh, but yeah, having the extra time does does absolutely help. Yes. Uh, moving on to Minecraft Snapshot 20W10A. We have to work out. We're into the the double digits now. Uh, links to the to the show notes for, or the uh, the snapshot notes rather for this will be at Minecraft.net and linked in our show notes. New features included added crimson and warped uh, hyphae, uh, all sided stem uh, blocks, including stripped variations. Used a smithing use for the smithing table uh, to fuse netherite ingot with your a diamond weapon tool or armor and new ambient sounds in the nether biomes we also have changes to things like fish that are now despawning when they are farther than 64 blocks away from the closest player hoes are now more the, the uh the sorry their hoes are now more like the other tools and used to break blocks uh, updated the netherite texture items bartering a uh, loot has been tweaked once again to bring back soul sand make netherite hose less common and remove add items to better fit survival players um, hoe changes each tier has a different speed at which the hoe mines blocks they take different effective um, speeds of course uh, hose can now be enchanted with the following enchantments efficiency fortune silk touch uh, those enchantments uh, are now provided through the enchanting table Bartering loot changes include soul sand being back, netherite hoe being much less common, as I mentioned. Shroom light has been removed and warped fungus has been removed. Iron nuggets are also added. New tags for item frames, which I find particularly interesting, is invisible. Make them fr uh, make the frame invisible. Uh, inside the item remains visible. Fixed prevents the item frame from being broken and the item inside from being removed. Uh, I believe you can still rotate the item, though. Yeah. Fixed bugs of note, there are many, so I would encourage you to go read the, sh the, uh, the notes for this patch. But uh, MC146824, inconsistency, ladders and tripwire hooks cannot be placed on the side of redstone blocks, observers, and target blocks. I would expect redstone people are going to be taking advantage of that. MC170829, when dropped, sorry, when dropping netherite tools and armor into lava, it sounds as if they are burning. Also looks like they're burning too, but that's been fixed. Uh, MC173244, target block moved by pistons permanently kept their signal strength. So it uh, looks like the target block is just could be behaving a little bit more consistently, which I, I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I will briefly touch on Minecraft Dungeons because a Minecraft Dungeons icon was added to the Minecraft launcher this week. It appears under any other Minecraft games you can launch from the Java Edition launcher, which right now is just minecraft java edition but there's also a tab for news so there's actually more stuff being added to the sidebar there there is nothing there as of yet it's just another link to sign up for email notifications for beta playing the game when more information becomes available uh add, add yourself to a mailing list effectively and as far as we know the release window is still april 2020 which now we are over a week into march is next month um so hopefully we'll be uh, getting early access to minecraft dungeons fairly soon and we'll have a a bigger report for you on the podcast when we are able to play it because i'm looking forward to it i think it's going to be a really nice, oh, yeah. refreshing take on minecraft as a, a a visual style and also could potentially give you a bit of inspiration for designing your own environment like that within minecraft which is something we're going to touch on a little bit later as our main topic but for now let's let's give our opinions about the snapshot because we've already kind of said our piece about uh, minecraft festival being cancelled what do you like about this snapshot and what do you think is still still to come potentially uh, I'm really looking forward to the item frame changes. Uh, it's it was a little bit of a note, but uh, like a side note. But I feel like it's gonna for those of us that are okay with it and and do use some small data packs for things. Um, I feel like giving data packs uh, the ability to hide item frames or you know change the. I mean, you can already change the texture, but if you wanted to just have an item frame not appear there and be able to stick something onto a wall uh, and have it look like it's part of the build. Um, we were talking about like micro blocks and stuff in the in the pre-show uh i feel like you know having the ability to put something into an item frame and then have the item frame not visible uh is is kind of a it's going to be a fun thing for builders um i also think that we don't talk about this much on the show because you and i don't really do it but map designers people that are making like adventure maps and games and things like that being able to have that kind of design freedom and utility i think is going to be really cool for people that are coding these maps and doing these things behind the scenes to have again have something be visible there you know like we all know that you can put an item in an item frame and then take a redstone signal output from it uh it would be even cooler if you could do that with what looks like a button on a wall but there's no item frame there like it just it creates a little bit more immersion which i think is going to be really cool yeah it, um, it's it's one of the things that i think people do most with item frames in texture packs is just to 
d- completely delete the texture and make it invisible just like turn turn mm-hmm. the alpha channel all the way up and i think yep. it's um it's it's good that that now gives the uh texture pack creators a chance for even more versatility with item frames because you can just have it invisible using a data tag then that means you can do whatever you want with the texture of the item frame and and that gives you more options i think that's it's adding versatility to item frames which is much needed not to mention the fixed tag as well is actually super useful considering that a lot of people will want to not have their item frames eject from the wall when you accidentally left click on them instead of right clicking on them for, for those right. kind of rotating comparator signal outputs especially yeah. so that's so that's very good out of this out of curiosity um can like, can you set these tags you have to set them by code or you have to set them by a certain i assume it would certain, be commands yeah yeah so do you would do you feel that that kind of access is outside of vanilla gameplay L- like would you want the ability as a minecraft player to be able to um like place down an item like an item frame and then say visible invisible locked or unlocked as a player this is a tricky one because i think vanilla gameplay absolutely default gameplay absolutely survival gameplay i don't okay. know and and I it's, the it's wrong word. no no it's fine it's it's one of those distinctions that is difficult to pass a little bit because we have so many different ways of explaining how we like to play in this mm-hmm. game and there are so many variations on what people consider vanilla like i i think of hermitcraft for example as a vanilla server some people would argue it's a modded server because they have data packs that change a lot of stuff about the way gameplay works not fundamental stuff like what blocks are out there and what blast furnace smelts what item but you know they have data packs that allow them to uh you know uncraft certain types of items or they they can craft infinite coral sometimes if they if they have that pack installed they have the armor Mm -hmm. stand uh posing book uh like you guys do on the citadel which allows you to create more detail in kind of the same way as these invisible item frames do and i can imagine a lot of them finding it much simpler to have an invisible item frame thing instead of having to pose an armor stand in a specific way um would certainly save a lot of time if you just want an item hanging from a wall or like a stake laying on a table or something like that that yeah exactly makes, makes a lot more sense to me um i don't know if i want it to be in survival because i kind of again this is one of those personal preference things but i like the challenge of trying to work in ways that make the you know the item frame not look as obvious in its surroundings or you know disguise it or use it in ways like when you're making those kind of torch holding things in a wall where you you kind Mm -hmm. of rotate a stair in an item frame you still have the item frame there in the background but because the detail of the torch is so interesting it kind of draws your eye away from the fact that there is obviously an item frame there so you can sometimes use it in ways that add detail to the environment instead of being distracting so i'm not necessarily 100 percent on board with yeah all item frames should be invisible and we should have access to that then again it does get a little bit frustrating when there is a bit of a distance in the community between people who have you know armor stand detail packs and allow themselves to spawn in custom heads for detail and folks like me who are kind of like it's a little bit cheaty to do that because that's still not something that you can do straight out of the box with the game it's something that you have to modify the game slightly in order to do but i'm a purist yeah. uh, i'm like that yeah. <laughs> i kind of we, yeah we do it's it's why it's why i poked the bear i was i was just <laughs> i was curious to, to find out what you might say and, and this is i i have the same opinions about the you know that you do about like you know hiding the item frame or using them in an interesting way or i like putting them on stairs so they don't look like quite something hung on the wall they look yeah. more like a like a hook or something like that so they they, they ha- kind of hang off the end of an upside down stair that sort of mm-hmm. thing but the issue that i have with that sort of stuff is like oh that would be great if the item frame was a neutral texture and it's yeah. red and brown or, yes. or burgundy and brown like it's just it's not something that like if you get a quartz room it's really hard to make that not look obvious uh whereas if it was you know glass and because i've seen that you know, like a custom texture for item frames where people just like create like a neutral gray frame and like a floating glass kind of texture in the middle and it still functions the same way but it just blends into everything a lot easier when it's more neutral colors because then you can put it on anything and it just kind of looks like it's meant to be there yeah um but yeah so like it's it's tricky in, in that kind of regard i just i i wish there was 
I wish there was a way to do more of that kind of stuff in game, even if it meant like having to, to faff around with redstone, you know, like maybe a powered item frame disappears. Like it, there, it, there could be some really fun things that you could have, you know, play around with that. I, I, I don't necessarily want to make it easy, but I feel like there could be more options there. And I guess part of the frustration is like, well, this exists in the game but it's not accessible to survival players. And I feel like, well, there could be some gameplay designed around that, which I feel sometimes is a missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, my other th uh, thoughts, because I know that you have some um, on the snapshot are pretty brief. Um, I'm still curious where, and if we're going to see warped wart, uh, like nether wart as a plant item thing in the game that you can plant yeah. on soul sand. Mm -hmm. um, I like the look of the nether sprouts. I think they're really well designed and very you know cool looking. And I would love to see something like that. And I would love to see something where maybe um, Nether Wart and Warped Wart, whatever that might be, would emit particles. I feel like that's probably too much for the game and might be laggy. Um, but it would be really cool to be able to put one of these things down in your garden and have little spores kind of come off of it. Yeah. Um, I understand that that would be a technical limitation, but but I do think that we we it would be cool to have warped wart as as a plantable farmable thing uh, and we could still see it we don't really know it just feels weird that you've got warped wart blocks and nether wart blocks in the crimson and warped forests respectively but then you you don't have there's there's a there's a item in the tree missing you know what i mean um so i'm looking forward to something like that and then um the other thing that i noticed was um the bartering loot changes seem okay i feel like they increased quartz nether quartz drops yeah um, obsidian and, is more common as well and yeah, and, yeah. and soul sand is back so they added some stuff in because i remember you said that last week when removing soul sand meant that soul sand was now no longer infinitely re renewable yeah. even if it was low yes um but they've removed warp fungus and shroom lights from the drop list completely so yeah it also feels like a nerf in that regard because now those aren't renewable and it's like well <laughs> which which is which um i'm not saying that there's not plenty of that kind of stuff out there but um if you end up playing the game like i do when you have these beautiful new biomes i tend not to want to clear cut stuff <laughs> like, yeah you know i i, I want to harvest a couple of trees to get some saplings and then i go make a farm somewhere i don't want to destroy the natural landscape yeah that's uh, maybe that's it's just my, the environmentalist in me it's my thoughts entirely on this i mean i shroom lights i can take or leave because they appear naturally when you grow the That's warped true. fungus or the or the crimson fungus but the fact that they have now you, you can you can't barter those anymore has been done for the sake of survival balance which is presumably an exploration thing you know you want players to be able to go further and further afield to find biomes to maybe pick up the fungus from those biomes and then bring that back but it limits where players can grow this stuff and it limits how you know if you want to gather a lot of those new blocks the stems and so forth i think the stem blocks are probably the most appealing ones out of the lot i can take or leave the new kind of blue nether wart the warped warp blocks um but i think the stems are going to be the ones that you want to build with either breaking them down from planks or just keeping them as they are and especially now hyphae have been added and you're presumably going to use four of those to make three uh of the hyphae blocks the same way that logs convert four to three when you want the bark texture on all six sides you're just going to be going through resources at such a rate that you are going to have to clear cut large areas. And I don't necessarily like that. Um, also, the fact that it's going to be even harder to do that in the nether, because now that we have hose to break the warp, uh, the warped water and crimson warp blocks, you can, you know, clear those quite quickly, but they don't decay naturally. So once you chop down the stems of those trees, the rest of the blocks around them aren't going to go away the same way leaves do in the overworld which means right. you're going to end up with players going through, stealing all of the stems, probably not wanting to take down all of the warp blocks, and then anyone else who comes through there is just going to see a bunch of canopies with nothing holding them up. And I feel like that's kind of a weird... like it, It's like it's making worse the problem of people only cutting down the bottom section of the tree that they can reach from the ground and not getting rid of the top part, which I know mm -hmm. is like is, is kind of heresy in, in survival servers. It's one of those things that people get really annoyed about you doing. I feel like that's only going to get worse if we don't have access to those things renewably. And I imagine they might have a plan to put those in renewably somehow, but if they don't, I feel like that's missing a trick a little bit. And I feel like while that has been done in favor of survival balance so that people just don't infinitely farm all the stuff they want from piglins, I still think just have those warp blocks occasionally drop a fungus as well as the block itself. Just add a loop table that allows them to be renewable because I would really love to right. be able to 
have as much of that as I want to, not necessarily as easily as just chucking gold at some piglins, but still, I don't like the fact that it's no longer renewable again. Yeah, well, because because we know that if you, um, as of last week, if you bone meal the proper nylium, you will get potential. That's where you can get the other trees. Or sorry, if you bone meal the fungus on the proper nylium, you will get the larger tree. Yeah, and thus be able to farm it that way. So it's it's renewable with a bone farm, which I mean most people can find an easy way to do these days, especially with the addition of a composter. So. It's possible there if, as you said, you can get the fungus as a drop similar to sapling. Yeah, we just need some way to get them. And I'm not sure if um, hoglins can drop crimson fungus because they eat it. So maybe that could be some reason, again, to start a hoglin farm. But once again, that's stuff that you end up farming or, you know, whether, whether casually or via, via some kind of like really intense nether contraption um, that I've seen some people building like very powerful mm. hoglin farms, then... You know, you could end up getting a lot of it one way or another. Anyway, relying on exploration being the only way of getting an item limits the experience for people who don't necessarily want to explore. And I've noticed a couple of the developers, King B Dogs especially, has been quite active on Twitter over the last few days, asking people to contribute to this as a debate, asking if, you know, technical players are going to get a little bit annoyed by and, and how the balance really affects them if they have some features which are only really available through exploration and a lot of people mm. are interpreting that as some way of talking about the availability of netherite but i think warped water and crimson wart are kind of worked in there as well by the way i pointed this out on twitter the other day uh warped wart if you say it enough just starts to sound like you're talking like an enderman uh because they have that kind of warp warp kind of noise that they make and i've <laughs> i kind of wonder if endermen have just been saying warped wart all along oh. and now and and those are the biomes endermen spawn in now in the nether update so i'm like have they just been searching for this the entire time and they've only just now found it i'm confused oh do, like, do endermen I know when Endermen pick up blocks, they hold it like down low in yeah. front of them. Do they ever have it above them in a straight line? Like, do they ever hold it up high? No, they, they only they only no. ever hold it like they're they're kind of holding a wheelbarrow almost. So, if anyone from Moyang is listening, Endermen in the warped wart forest should hold the blocks above their head and go warp in, warp <laughs> warp 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 victory like, yeah, they, like we, we got it we i did have it, found guys. the thing <laughs> yeah. the thing i have the thing do you have the thing i also have the thing <laughs> just, yeah uh, too just, funny I, it's, it's making me think of those those tnt yeah. yeeting things that people have done with grindstones and like holding a tnt above the head of whatever kind of thing with like an observer oh on the front. yes yeah, i i yeah. <laughs> i'm imagining them holding it like that and just going i got uh, it <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I, 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 something that I was thinking about over the week, cause I watched a couple of videos about these hoglin farms that just pump out more pork than you know what to do with. Yeah. Uh, piglins and hoglins fight. We don't necessarily say, necessarily know what, well, piglin, um, hoglins eat crimson fungi. Yeah. And they, they're yeah. scared and they run away from warped fungi. Run yeah. away from warped fungi. I kind of want, I kind of want the hoglins to be like sharks. Like when you kill them, I kind of want, you know, whatever they've eaten to be a potential drop. Yeah. So like gold sword, you know, what, whatever, you know, some, any, basically anything in the nether, it would be really cool if they were like a garbage compactor and like you just, you ended up with this, this dead hoglin, but then you got whatever it happened to eat or whoever it happened to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like I think that would be really like magma cream, like who, like just it, to me, it would, it would m m make as much sense as the piglin bartering but it would be i mean you could have a smaller loot table and maybe less often but just i just find it would add this level of humor i think to the game where it's just like why does it have a whoa if he it, you just kind of have to connect the dots of like why did i get a gold sword when i killed the hoglin oh maybe the hoglin killed a piglin before <laughs> before yeah. i got here and they're and just decided, like they're just like goats or whatever they'll just eat anything eat anything like, yeah just yeah. like garbage come back to the raccoons really of the nether um <laughs> I, I want to talk record. about I want to talk about these ambient sounds though. I don't oh, know if you've dude. had a chance to hop into the latest snapshot, but they... uh, I have not hopped in. But Slice Slime, of course, did an excellent job in his video of showcasing the sounds and yeah. turned up the volume. So I I heard them that way. I tried to do the same thing in my video about this snapshot. I covered this snapshot and the last one in my latest video because Crying Obsidian still didn't have a use. That felt like some of the features they'd added were just kind of placeholders for now. 
I love this ambient soundscape they've added to the nether. It adds such personality and atmosphere to each of these biomes as well. And now the overworld sounds eerily quiet by comparison. It's almost, <laughs> I, sp I spent most of that episode in the nether with the ambient sounds cranked all the way up. I came back to the overworld to demonstrate the smithing table thing where you can combine stuff in a smithing table now, where the GUI still needs a little bit of work. I presume it's just a placeholder, but more thoughts on that later. But it was just like, the silence was deafening almost, and it's unsettling coming back to the overworld after that. So... My thoughts on that are yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Add stuff like this to the game, please. Because aside mm. from the music, which most people play with music off so they can listen to their own music, or so in my case, you know, so that the, when I'm making edits in my videos, I don't have to worry about the music editing halfway through. I can add the music in post. Um, the ambience, though, is so nice. And, you know, it, because it's a continuous kind of looping thing instead of something melodic, it matters less when it comes to cutting video together it's it's so it's so atmospheric and i didn't add it i didn't have the music going at the same time but i imagine that would build up to a really dramatic and intense picture and something that would be genuinely kind of scary like it, it puts mm. you on edge when you're in the nether um they've done a great job of the sound design like hats off to the sound team it's superb um and I really hope it sets a precedent for them adding ambient sounds to the overworld now. We've talked about this in previous episodes with, you know, you, yep. vis you visit a beach biome or an ocean, you hear the sound of water lapping on the shore or waves just kind of tossing you around. You have birds tweeting in forest biomes, that kind of thing. As long as it doesn't end up simulating stuff that isn't there, like, for example, bees buzzing or something is going to make you think there's a beehive nearby when potentially there's not. So some stuff does need to still right. be triggered by the actual stuff in the game, but even just giving you stuff that isn't necessarily there, like the chirping of birds. There aren't birds aside from parrots and chickens, I guess, really. But it, it, it's just going to add something, or like just the gentle rustling of leaves in the wind or something like that is really mm -hmm. going to add some atmosphere to the overworld that is currently lacking in a sense. And it's controllable by a, a volume slider. So if you don't like it, you can just turn the ambience all the way down and the only thing you are losing at that point is cave sounds. Um, right. On that topic, though, I really hope Bedrock Edition gets dedicated volume sliders soon. And I've been playing a bit of Bedrock Edition, uh, collaborating with my good friends, Loy. Um, there are two volume sliders in Bedrock Edition, which are music and sound effects. <laughs> and I usually play without music, of course, but putting everything else on the sound effects sliders is going to be a problem when you introduce stuff like ambient sounds, because for a start, it makes fine tuning impossible. And also the ambient sounds, when you have them cranked all the way up, are pretty loud, but you want to be able to hear some stuff over the ambience of the nether. You want to be able to hear when the zombie pigmen are mad at you or when an enderman mm. has spotted you and you get that kind of rising, angry enderman sound. And it's going to be more difficult when the soundscape is so layered. And so I really hope Bedrock gets sound sliders like Java has where it's split off into different options and you can have more control over that. Because I don't think Bedrock players are necessarily like even if it's you know on mobile or console or something like that they're going to want that level of fine detail and i'm surprised that it hasn't been added sooner but i think there are still a few other things that they really need to add to bedrock from a sound perspective subtitles being one um but i really wish that they they split that out a little bit more so that you can control the level of ambient noise you're getting if you don't mm. want that i even uh have spotted a number of uh, inconsistencies in the java sliders um, yeah. In the end, in particular, hostile mob noises like Endermen, even at three percent, are crazy loud. Yeah. Like there's there's no there, the slider doesn't slide anything. It's just you have to turn them off or turn them on. And yeah. and anything above five percent is no different than a hundred percent. Like I and the dragon is also loud. I watched a couple of uh, streams uh, or videos recently where even the people playing were complaining like wow this is in like why is this this loud this should yeah. not be this loud like, whenever well, i fight the, i fight the dragon i have to go in afterwards and turn down the audio track for game sounds a lot of the time yeah. because i yeah, can't no, hear it's, myself it's... over it no exactly you can't hear yourself think yeah um, and on so bedrock yeah, I... on bedrock that is worse i remember fighting the dragon on bedrock and we had all of the sound effects and stuff probably on 50 percent, and the dragon was was distorting it was that loud and it right. didn't seem that loud at the time but on the record for some reason it just like blew out the the soundtrack and so yeah i, I really think that needs a little bit of adjustment um <laughs> aside yeah. from that 
Um, I think the the soundscapes, like I said, are really well done. It's cool to hear like distant sounds of the wither when you're in a soul sand biome. There's this kind of like crescendo of <sighs> that happens. That's mm. very much like the sound the wither makes when it dies. Um, and that alludes to the fact that the soul sand all around you is what is used to create the wither. Um, you have kind of distorted enderman sounds and kind of end themed sounds in the warped biomes, which are great for their inhabitants. And likewise, everything else just lends a little bit of atmosphere to the entire experience. So hats off, sound team. You've done a really good job. I agree. Um, let's briefly touch on the smithing table because that has functionality now, which is something we've been talking about for a long time. How do you feel about it being used to upgrade stuff to netherite level? Uh, upgrade stuff to netherite level and maintain the enchantments, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, but the right. but the the upgrading has been moved entirely to the smithing table for now, so you can't do it in a crafting interface anymore. It has to be done through the smithing table. Right. Uh, I, taking things away can sometimes feel bad, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it can avoid confusion. So you would not want someone to think they can upgrade it on the crafting table and have it lose all of its enchantments, and then realize the hard way that they have to then go and move it on the smithing table and upgrade it that way. Uh, my only kind of feedback on that, um, while I like the functionality, the smithing table itself, the interface I'm hoping is in progress because it's yeah. pretty... It's very, it's very up. bare bones. It's literally like... Bare two bones even for Minecraft, yeah. Two, two boxes and some text. And I think my problem with it so far is that this doesn't feel like it was the plan for the smithing table all along. It mm. seems like it's something that has been done as a result of player feedback, at which point I'm like, so what are we losing from the smithing table? Did they have a plan in the first place and they're just now realizing that maybe the smithing table should be used for this as well? And if this is all it does, this feels a little bit like an oversight to me because mm. for a start, we still have no answers about what the fletching table does. And since those are the two without functionality right now, it feels like maybe they should be getting attention around the same time. Um, mm. and, and I can't see us making netherite arrows yet, at least, so I'm not sure how that's going to work out. No, but, the, uh, my, the fletching table stuff for me has always been like, that seems like the place where you're going to combine potions and arrows, and much like the loom has taken over uh, banner the crafting, way to make yeah. banner, banner crafting and things. Like I, I get the idea that it would be a good way um, to do that kind of stuff. I also, I don't use the new blocks very much. Like cartography table, I need to look into that because I, I want to make some maps for the modern city and I'm going to have to learn a little bit more about the cartography table to be probably more efficient and have some better tools at my disposal. Yeah, um, yeah. Lock, locking comes... maps is pretty fun as well. If you want to do like uh, map art with those, then that's that's a vital right. piece. But that's again a very niche thing and it also niche takes thing. a lot of time to make map art. So oh, yeah. not for everyone. No. No, but the thing that I wanted to, to with the smithing table, like I, at, while I feel it's pretty minimal and I don't really, I mean, it's okay. I'm not complaining about that's how you do it because I, I get, mainly because I don't see myself doing it anyway, you know, yeah, just yeah. upgrading to another right tool. But I just don't know what else it could be used for. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm kind of at a loss because I was thinking, oh, we could combine tools. Nope. We do that on an anvil already. Yeah. Um, well, we could, you know, use it for, you know, other stuff like um, I'm trying to think about like uh, adding features and things like that that you get in like modded Minecraft where you uh, tweak and augment by combining different elements. But it's like, well, they they obviously just they did that with Netherite and it's kind of an all or nothing. There's no nuance to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i kind of at a blank uh, outside of it being a really interesting blue metal texture. I, you know, I, I don't think about the smithing table that much. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested to see if the smithing table functionality gets expanded upon as a result of this, if we could maybe upgrade some iron tools into diamond tools just by putting one diamond in there, if that becomes a system whereby you can keep the same tools and augment them every time you go up a tier, in which case it completely changes the balance of what diamonds are used for in survival, so that could potentially be like a good or a bad thing. Um, but if this is the only use for the smithing table, frankly, I'm a little bit underwhelmed and I kind of hope we see, you know, a, a few more adjustments to that and a bit more functionality added because mm -hmm. the other crafting tables at least have a bit more depth to their functionality for me, 
at least. Yeah. No, Let's absolutely. move on to emails because we talked about the snapshot for a fair while at this point. Ah, sounds like a good idea. And actually, it's a, it's a short and sweet email this week from Rebel Elias. Hey, I recognize that name. Uh, Mick Busy versus Busy Building. Hi, Johnny and Joel. You're both working on massive projects that will keep you busy for several weeks. I would say several months, actually. <laughs> in my uh, in, case, in, definitely. Yeah. In my own world, I've been noodling on a Stone Age village build for a month or more. And just wanted, uh, when I think I've got the notion to begin, I spend an hour collecting honey from a beehive or collecting pumpkin seeds from my garden. How do you keep all of the errands and tasks from being distract a distraction long enough to make progress on larger projects? Your squirrel in training, Rabelias. Uh, thanks for the great email. Uh, Johnny, I know that you've probably got some thoughts on this. So like, what, what, how would you approach uh, the, the errands and stuff in Minecraft? Well, if you come up with an answer for that, let me know. Because I, I feel like I'm only able to put the time into the projects I have because I play Minecraft for multiple hours every day. And because it's all working towards YouTube and Twitch content. So I still have not finished so many of the building projects I have in my world because... I was distracted by other things and maybe that's because I want to do a tutorial on something small for my YouTube channel but my main city build that I've been working on for ages is still not done and here I am you know 5,000 blocks away building mountains uh, which are taking forever uh, so yeah I think you have to embrace the fact that for most players um, longer build projects are a marathon and not a sprint so you you've had these ideas for a month or more and it can take you a couple more months to even act on them and, and build stuff and that's in a way that's okay because i presume what you are getting out of collecting honey from beehives or you know working on your garden that kind of stuff you know little details around the house maybe that is still fun for you and ultimately the main scope of the thing is that you are you are having fun that's the point um, mm. obviously you know build projects as aspirations are great and i'm sure the stone age village project is going to turn out for you eventually but you've got to wonder why that's like a concern you know you, you, you don't need to have that as an objective and you don't need to prove anything to anybody by building it as soon as possible it can it can wait and if you feel like you are building up your ideas for it in the meantime then then that's super cool um the only other thing i can think of is um you know, automate your pumpkin collection so you don't have to collect the seeds yourself. Automate the beehive stuff so that you can um, you can collect honey passively in the background, right? How, yeah, how would you tackle yeah. that kind of problem? That's that's precisely my answer. The, the two things that, that Rebel Ice mentioned in the email uh, are things that you can automate. And, and that's where... That's another I time sink all of itself, though. That's the yeah, Well, that's the thing. I... That's this is where I land. I don't like collecting pumpkins manually from a garden. I don't like collecting sugarcane manually even though it's probably one of the more efficient ways to do it in terms of just like how much you can get quickly. But for me, uh, I can move on with my larger projects because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the blocks that I've got, uh, either it's an old world and, and I have a lot of the stuff lying around, or I've got a lot of the items I need uh, coming in automatically. Bones, for example, a lot of white concrete in the new city build, but I have i'm not hurting for bones because i've got multiple skeleton spawners on the on the server same thing with wool we've got a triple spider cave spider spawner uh that was one of our first xp farms so we have more string than we know what to do with and yeah. we're converting a lot of that into wool and if we need more of it it's really easy it just means that the next time you repair your gear you repair it at the spider farm instead of the enderman farm and you mm -hmm. just you end up you know restocking the string uh chests and by having some automation in the world, I think it will free you up in terms of your time. Uh, it's one of the things I didn't, I did not like about Skyblock is that every time I walked by the sugarcane, wheat, pumpkins, and melons, I felt like I had to harvest it, and that's yeah. not what I wanted to do. I wanted to work on my Nether portal, or I wanted to work on my other things. Uh, every time I walked by the the um, the mob farm, um, mainly because I was using it for XP, but also because I was trying to get villagers and other things like that. Like, I felt like I had to stay in the mob farm and hack at stuff. And I didn't want to do that. I would much prefer to have an automated system. But without iron, without hoppers, I wasn't able to have an automatic collection system. And so you have the ability in, in survival, not so much Skyblock, um, until you're at a certain level. But in, in survival, if you've got enough resources to set up some automation, even small automation, it doesn't have to be... 90,000 sugar cane an hour. You know, like you, if it's just you and you're just needing some books, like you can just create a small, you know, eight wide uh, sugar cane farm. And if it's loaded, it's just going to passively create stuff in the background and save you a lot of time in the long run. I make no claims on learning redstone, not taking a ton of time. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you may end up putting 
two steps backwards and then three steps forwards in order to get some automation going. But in the long run, it's going to be uh, beneficial to you. And I'll use an example that I'm, I'm dealing with right now. I need to create a TNT concrete maker in my city. I, even though it's a good excuse to chat with a chat uh, live on Twitch when I make concrete, this single block, look at a, you know, double click um, right and left and just manually create concrete, even with like an automatic dispenser giving me, an, you know, another stack of powder as I go through stuff, it's still slow. Yeah, uh, compared to how quickly I go through stuff. So if I was just building with concrete all stream long, I would be hitting that concrete maker probably twice, three times an hour. Yeah. Whereas if I go and in a minute can do nine stacks of concrete, I could chat for a, a couple of minutes and then create a shulker box of concrete, which is going to last me a lot longer. Yeah. So th those are the kind of things that if you take the time to build the farm or build the the automation, then you will save yourself time in the long run, which leaves more free time for, for planning. Um, the other thing that I, I think is important to notice, which it's a little bit more apparent now, because I notice a lot of um, YouTubers are, are mentioning things about Twitch uh, streams and how long a project has taken and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I know I recognize you from my Twitch community and probably Pixel Rifts as well. So you're familiar with that kind of stuff. But anybody that's out there that's listening is like, gosh, I don't know how people put this kind of time in. Pay attention to the streams or pop by some of someone streaming and see just how long it actually takes. There's a bit of a mis misnomer when you're watching people that one, potentially are Minecraft and YouTubers for a living. So it is their day job. Uh, and two, they might glaze over the fact that, uh, oh, we did this on a live stream. And they don't mention that it was like two, three hour streams of clearing a guardian farm or creating a pyramid or building a mountain like Pixlerus is doing. So like it, it, sometimes it can feel like these things are just springing up out of nowhere in some of your favorite Minecraft videos when really there's 12 or 14 hours of work sometimes in there. And it's just not always kind of like hammered home. This is, this is how it's been done. I experienced this myself when I first started learning how to paint digitally in Photoshop. A lot of the tutorials and stuff online are time-lapse videos and they're not sped up a lot. They're just sped up like at like two times speed so that the artist can still clearly talk about what they're doing, give you some education, and you can see what's going on. But the problem is that even though I know it's a sped up video, because that's what I have visually taken in, I would get really frustrated when I was working on a painting and it wasn't going as fast as I wanted it to. <laughs> yeah. And it was because I had this false impression of like, this should be going faster. I should be painting quicker. And I actually took the time to download a video from someone that I enjoyed and used my video editing skills to put it back at normal speed. And then I was like, oh, wow. Like there's like points in this video where the cursor isn't even moving. Like it's just, it's a lot slower when you look at it in real time. And I think that's important to do, even if you're not a big stream fan, just kind of tuning into one or two streams of one of your favorite YouTube creators and looking at how long it actually takes them to do stuff. I took two hours yesterday to design a garden fence. It's 30 blocks long, two hours. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. mean, I, hashtag perfectionist but still <laughs> i would estimate that i have probably put 30 to 40 hours into building these mountains at this point and that's 120,000 stone placed so yeah there's it, there's no substitute for just putting the time in at the end of the day and uh, yep. i think you talking about uh speed art and an artist actually ties in really well to our discussion topic this week uh we're talking about using art as inspiration and this is inspired in itself by friend of the show mythical sausage who recently released a video about how to build a minecraft house inspired by concept art and if you head over to his channel and watch that and then head over to his twitter feed which i believe is just at mythical sausage on twitter he's actually retweeting a lot of people who are posting the concept art side by side with them having built a house like that in Minecraft. And so I figured we could reopen this discussion because we've talked about it in the past and we're going to keep it relatively brief here because I know we're short on time. I want to have us suggest a few approaches, a few resources and places you can look for inspiration for your Minecraft builds because we all know inspiration is one of those things that's difficult to come by if you don't know where to look. We would like to share a little bit of advice about where to look. So Joel, being the artist of the two of us, why don't you kick us off? Well, I'm going to kick it down to a simplified version of this, and that is uh, Lego, specifically Lego and Lego ideas. Uh, I have pulled a number of, of ideas from 
uh, the Lego Ideas website. So these are creator design builds in Lego. So they're not meant to be a play set so much as sometimes they're meant to be a model or they're meant to be a certain piece of architecture. And they can be really, really intuitive. The Inn on a Bridge, which I designed on the Citadel, was based off of a Lego Ideas build of the same name. And I tweaked it. I mean, obviously you have to, there's a little bit of translation change because Lego bricks are a different dimension. They're they're not as tall as they are wide in many cases. Uh, even the two by two Lego brick, which is the closest you'll get to a Minecraft block is not a cube. It's a little bit squat. And, and so um, it takes a little bit of adjusting, but man, oh man, can you ever get close? Like you can, you can really get yourself into a position where you can recreate something inspired by Lego with a tighter blueprint than you could by just looking at a painting. Because when you're looking at a painting, as I'm sure Mythical Sausage will explain, there's a little bit more of interpretation and, and a little bit more of adjustment going on um, because of the width of Minecraft blocks and things. So I would suggest taking a look at Lego. In particular, if you're working on cities, then I would look at something like um, the creator expert sets, the modular builds for Lego cities. They're really good. Uh, proportions are also about the same too. Like a Lego minifig is around the same size as, as a Minecraft fig, uh, player. Um, and that's, I think, one of the reasons I like Lego minifig builds so much is that as play sets, they're designed with the minifig in scale. And so they, they kind of help you with getting that Minecraft scale right. Yes. Um, as far as uh, a ne like the next level above that in terms of like ease and, and access would be looking up models. Uh, the, not, was it the, I think the roof of my wheat mill on the Citadel was inspired by other Minecraft builds because I'd never done anything like that before. But the bottom part, the stone walls and the wheel and the stairs and the, the bay, you know, the hail bay underneath the, the mill, they were actually modeled after, uh, houses from a model train set. So I looked up um, small models. You know, I was looking up train models and house models, and uh, I can't remember the exact term that you have to search for, but you can find it pretty quick on Google. Um, like model train sets or, or um, uh, not maquettes, but it's they call them something specific. Uh, yeah. But because they're a physical sculpture, you can see them from different angles. You don't have to imagine it. Usually when you see photos of these things that are for sale, they've put them on a little pedestal and they've turned them around 360 degrees and you can see, oh, that's what the windmill looks like from the front, the back, the side, the top, you know, et cetera. And that I found really helpful. Again, it's, it's more complicated than a Minecraft build and more complicated than a Lego build, but it gives you just structural ideas. And, and someone has already done the research as to what a medieval windmill would look like and put the pillars and the stones and the windows and the, probably the proper places so you don't really have to do as much imagination or uh, or interpretation as you would have uh, otherwise um last but not least i've mentioned this a couple times on the podcast but artstation.com is an excellent resource uh specifically because it has a great search feature where you can narrow things down by the medium so you can say i want a 3d you know like a model uh, like a like a video game model or you can say, I'd rather look at paintings for inspiration. Give me landscape paintings or give me, uh, you know, paintings from Photoshop or whether it's real life paintings in watercolor or whether it's, you know, digital paintings and different things. You're going to get more concept art and fun stuff to play with if you do more like, you know, Photoshop, um, digital 2D um, sort of things. And then you can narrow it down by subject matter, like figures, vehicles. Uh, you can do, uh, I want to say they even have genres like sci-fi, fantasy, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I will give a little asterisk here and say, you know, parental advisory uh, or NSFW um, for work because it is an art site. There is some figure drawing. You might have some um, nudity, but it's not in a in a bad way. It's it's art. You know, like it's someone doing figure drawing and tasteful, uh, explore, taste, tasteful, uh, tasteful art, exploring human uh, human form, uh, which can lead to some you know uh, some figure drawing and things like that. Uh, if you're looking for uh, environments, you're, pr you're not going to see that much. So if you're, if you've got that search dialed in, then you're mostly going to be seeing landscapes. That, that kind of stuff is not going to creep in. But when you first pull up the page, they kind of just show you what's happening on the, on the site right now, which could be just about anything. Um, and I have a couple of artists I actually want to recommend. Uh, Andreas Rocha, R-O-C-H-A is fantastic. He does a lot of like medieval castles and, uh, he does some futuristic stuff too, but mostly it's, it's medieval stuff. And it really translate well to whenever I see one of his paintings, I'm just like, Whoa, I want to make that in Minecraft. I don't have the time, but mm -hmm. I really want to make that in Minecraft. Um, and then Tim Kaminsky, K 
K-A-M-I-N-S-K-I. And he does some more futuristic stuff uh, like Stonehenge and some stone monoliths with like, you know, neon lighting and things. It's a little bit more intricate on the inside, but he creates some really interesting shapes, a lot of verticality and a lot of straight edges. Uh, a lot of, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Bohemoth type stuff, which would translate very well to Minecraft and maybe like monolithic some... kind of yeah, monolithic stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, like re really kind of cool. He he puts a lot of history and culture, imagined history and culture into his work. So like you're looking at it and it looks like something that's been around for ages or was built by some mystery society. And we talk a lot about you know story in Minecraft as a way for people to keep inspired and, and have new projects. And having art like this is great because like sometimes you don't really get much of an explanation from the artist either. They just kind of create this cool visual thing and they've got some idea in their head about where it came from and who might have built it. But then it could be up to you to be inspired in Minecraft and maybe one painting from Kaminsky creates an entire world and mythos for you in, 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 um, in Minecraft. Uh, and last, I've got uh, Instagram. Instagram is where I follow some architecture accounts. Um, I try not to follow too many Minecraft accounts on Instagram, but if people have some good ones, aside from obviously friend of the show, Mythical Sausage, because <laughs> uh, I do I do follow him. Yeah. Um, I find some of the Minecraft channels and Minecraft um, accounts that are recommended to me in Instagram and the search functions tend to be pretty clickbaity. And they also tend to just regurgitate themselves or copy one another. And so it doesn't really give you a lot of new ideas. It's just like, well, here's how to build a house. Like, I know how to build a house. I'm looking for yeah. inspiration. Um, so I find following proper architecture um, is, is a lot more fun to be inspired by, especially if you like modern architecture, if you want to follow some stuff like that. Not only does it lend itself very well to Minecraft, um, but it's also really fun to kind of see what's happening around the world in terms of like the new library in Stockholm or like, you know, some other cool thing that's happening. Um, yeah. one, and the, an artist there that I'll recommend, um, on Instagram, who's not an architect, but does a lot of like concept drawings for buildings and stuff is Ian McHugh, M C Q U E. Um, he does really cool, like floating tugboats and like fantasy steampunky stuff and castles. And he's a very, very talented artist, but he also doesn't dial things in so tight that you can't just kind of take what he does and just use it as like a reference. You don't have to recreate it, but he might build a bridge or have a floating boat or have like an airship or just something that might kind of tweak your imagination and go, Oh, Hey, look, that could be something really cool. Um, before I toss this over to Johnny, one last recommendation. I'm going to have to to double check with Whip because we've had him on the show a couple of times. Obviously, a great reference for, for this. Whip shared with us uh, his Pinterest board. I don't recall whether that is a um, patron-only thing with him or whether he was just nice enough to share it with Johnny and I in our post-show discussion. It's been several months since we've had Whip on the show. Um, so I'll drop him a line and see if that's something that's public. And if it is, then I'll share it uh, in our show notes. But uh, until then, I would just maybe take a look at what Whip is doing because he has a lot of references and things. He talks about the same kind of stuff that Mythical does. Yeah, and if, you, if you're gathering... Um you know inspiration for a specific project pinterest is not a bad place to start um i haven't used the site much myself but it does seem like a good way to aggregate a lot of you know inspirational images and stuff and and kind of keep hold of all of that stuff so that you can pin it all to the same board and if you want medieval stuff and you can't remember which site you found it or which artist drew it in the first place it'll all just be there in one place uh, which is going to be super handy for you. Um, sometimes I've seen Minecraft builds kind of go in trends, um, and it's interesting to keep track of those and see if you want to participate in them if you are short on inspiration. Particularly, um, Mythical Sausage and Whip both did builds that were inspired by somebody whose name I now forget, uh, but they were kind of circular hobbit hole style things embedded in the side of mountains, and uh, they both built stuff like that as a kind of let's build, creative build on their channels. And then you see uh, Mumbo Jumbo and Grian doing similar stuff on the Hermitcraft server now. So it's funny to see these trends kind of arise. I think there was a similar thing on Reddit as well. So maybe everyone's just kind of either subconsciously or consciously ended up at the same kind of inspiration point at the same time so if you're looking for if not if not necessarily inspiration for a project then kind of a challenge to do somebody to tell you hey design something specifically like this if you're not sure where to go with a project then that's not a bad place to start um outside of that i would say to chase your interests as well because um, if you're interested in stuff like film and other video games, those are great sources of inspiration because of the amount of thought 
and the amount of professionals put to work on the design of sets for both movies and video games. They have to have environments to film in or environments where the game has to occur. And in the case of movies, the sets are in some cases practical. Like if you think about the stuff they created for the Lord of the Rings movies, going to the Hobbit hole theme again here, they had to create Hobbiton. It didn't exist in New Zealand beforehand. And they had to fabricate some of that stuff as a practical set and some of it as a digital set rather than it being a pre-existing location, which is really not that far away from the concept of constructing stuff in Minecraft, right? You know, they're picking out tools and they're picking out like different materials that then in their case they can paint over, but you of course have the luxury of all of your stuff being digital so you can choose the materials you're using to begin with. Um, and so looking up uh, you know, the, the making of books for films that you find the aesthetic of particularly appealing is probably a good way to go. Look up stuff like the Star Wars Visual Dictionary or any of the individual books about the set design and props and stuff from those movies and you will come away with a bunch of, you know, fairly coherent visual reference for building something that is themed along those lines. And remember, you don't always have to buy the books for this because libraries are a fantastic source of reference material like this. A lot of them don't mind you photocopying a couple of pages if it's just for personal reference. You know, it, it's it's probably going to be a good place to start to go down to your local library and find a book. And you can find books on all sorts of stuff there from architecture to graphic design to stuff about movies and even now probably more prominently a video game section that will tell you a little bit about the production of these games um expense expansive video game locations are often a really great and very explorable way of getting inspiration for stuff to build in minecraft too if you think about the cities that you find in assassin's creed some of which are based in real life locations and are meticulously modeled you can then explore those relatively freely the the game doesn't necessarily move you from one place to another particularly fast so you have a chance to look around and look at everything from 360 degrees which is often difficult to do it's difficult to visualize how a 2d painting works in a 3d space like minecraft and and so that's kind of part of the challenge in a way is figuring out okay so i can see one angle of that but what does the back of it look like and that's where you have to use your imagination a little bit more but with pre-modeled environments like you know jungle ruins that you'll find in a tomb raider game for example or the kind of epic mythology and fantasy locations that you find in the recent god of war game there are uh, you know uh, opportunities to walk around all of that stuff and also it will teach you a little bit about the placement of set pieces within those scenes so that you can draw the the viewer or the player's attention to a specific point uh so you can have a valley that sort of leads down to this epic looking temple at the end and your eye is naturally drawn in there and that sort of element kind of adds to the scene so that stuff you can pick up on for inspiration that's going to you know provide more than just a color palette or a build palette for a build it's going to provide a little bit more idea of the context in which those builds can sit which i think is a kind of important thing um there are also often behind the scenes featurettes about environment design for movies, video games, and and how they factor into storytelling. There is one uh, that we covered recently on the show for Minecraft Dungeons. They did a, an episode of that all about environment design, and where better to look than a game that's copying the visual aesthetic of a core Minecraft game for a dungeon crawler experience. That kind of stuff mm. can give you an idea of how you could lay out dungeon mini games in your own world, or even just locations if you want to have stuff like that in your world you can you can start there and it's going to be the most obvious visual one-to-one -one copy of some stuff that they can make there and just try and tweak it from there and make it your own that actually reminds me uh i follow a couple of voxel art hashtags on instagram mm. and um, sometimes very inspiring sometimes a little bit frustrating when you realize that the voxel size is actually small like smaller than minecraft like yeah they're yeah. they're using they're using the voxels that are probably like a, a quarter or an eighth of a minecraft block but like the, the form and the fact that everything has to have a straight line edge to it is it like helps and if they want to build anything on an angle then it looks like a checkerboard so like st you can at least get some sort of inspiration about how to like maybe translate it I actually i took a screenshot last night of what looked like a little cartoony starbucks that was a voxel art and um too too fine detailed for me to reproduce precisely in minecraft but it gave me the idea of like you know 
it's not a bad idea to have a giant coffee bean on the front of the sign rather than spelling out coffee. You yeah. know, you can just put a big mug, you know, or a big or a big bean or something like that on the top of the building. And that would kind of like signify, hey, giant cartoon coffee shop here, you know? <laughs> yeah, you got to have like logo design brain engaged instead of just, yeah, writing it in banners or in yeah, like giant lettering. Yeah, exactly. I think those point. are all really good, really good points. Um, and actually, uh, just before we, we move on uh, and before I forget, uh, Gold Robin, I believe, is the uh, Minecrafter you were talking about earlier, yes. Johnny, with the Hobbit hole stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, X, yeah. Gold Robin on uh on twitter and just gold robin on youtube yes that, thank you for that 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 was uh the, the name i was struggling to remember uh, i got a shout out to nash crafter that i i saw it float by on the weekend and i just i knew right where to go yes <laughs> i went to her feed to find to find gold robin yes uh well folks at home if you have any suggestions for other places that your fellow minecrafters can find inspiration of course you can email the show you can at us on twitter share this stuff around because i feel like the community occasionally needs a little injection of inspiration especially while we are still in the void between updates and hopefully you guys will have some interesting stuff to share with us uh, but that is going to wrap up this episode of the spawn chunks you can find more information about the show and links to some of the things we've talked about today at the spawnchunks.com the music for the show is composed by me and the spawn chunks is proud as always to be a listener supported podcast if you get some value out of the show consider Consider putting some value back in at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks you can join our discord community pledging at any level gets you an invite to our patrons only discord chat and there are even some exclusive chats for folks who are able to donate a little more each month it gets us closer to our next goal which is recording the spawn chunks live in discord so that people who are patrons can listen in and you can join a community of 162 patrons which is another increase from last week thank you so much to the folks who have joined always great to see you guys contributing to the discussion as soon as you hop into the discord and special thanks of course go out to our content engineers cameron sigelski greena canuck jd williamson and yitz for their support on this episode Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram, but a personal recommendation is by far the best way to support the show. Poke a friend in the arm, someone that you know, someone that you're talking to about Minecraft already and say, hey, you might actually enjoy The Spawn Chunks because I know that I do. You can email the show at thespawnchunks at gmail.com and share with us where you get your inspiration for Minecraft. Subscribe on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, and Spotify. We're also on YouTube. The extended version of the podcast is available at the Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. And of course, the RSS feed is on the main page, along with the show notes, the spawnchunks.com. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixel Riffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixel Riffs, where I attempt to make sense of this crazy and wonderful game in a series called The Minecraft Survival Guide. I also stream three days a week on Twitch, doing behind-the-scenes work for The Survival Guide. In this case, the scenes are a mountain. Uh, I'm also the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. And aside from that, I'm at Pixel Riffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything I am doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio, is at joelduggan.com. If you are interested in hiring me, then just drop me a line there. Thank you to uh, all the people that have actually dropped me a line. I've got quite a lot of people uh, emailing and asking me what's up. Uh, I apologize for the wait to get back to you. It is just, it's a little bit busy right now. Uh, but this is a good thing. I am not complaining, but just a little bit of patience. I will, I will get back to you. The Citadel Cafe is a podcast I do about sci-fi and geeky entertainment. You can find that at thecitadelcafe.com. And you can follow me on all the socials, just my name, Joel Duggan super easy to find but twitch is probably where i am the most active these days and that is twitch.tv slash joel duggan come hang out we have a lot of fun thanks for visiting the spawn chunks the world outside is infinite stay inspired